Here on the edge of the village are two American TDs, tank destroyers. They are sitting under the trees, watching and waiting for the German tanks to come up the road. Last night, one of them knocked out two German flat guns down in the village. Amongst the trees on both sides of the road here, American paratroops have crouched because just where the road bends there, just where it disappears into the mist, the road's under German small arms fire, and they're waiting while a patrol goes down to reconnoitre, which isn't an easy job when you can't see more than 10 yards in front of you. An excerpt from a BBC reporter on the ground at the Battle of Cheneau, December 20th, 1944. An attack led by a parachute infantry regiment from the 82nd Airborne. We'll speak to an author who's written a trilogy about the 504th right after this break. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spirit. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I wanted to tell you about a special limited time offer to snag a hardcover copy of my new book, Immortal Valor. For the first five people that join Point of the Spirit as listeners and supporters, at the $9 level, we'll ship out an autographed hardcover copy of the book with a special dedication inside. Essentially, for the cost of shipping, you'll receive a signed copy of my new book. To enter, scroll to the bottom of this episode's description, click the support link, fill out the form, sign up at the $9 level, and your book is on the way. But move fast, this offer is limited to the first five North American, that's US and Canada, listener supporters who grab this opportunity. Once they're gone, that's it. And good luck. Welcome back. Today's guest was born and raised in Arnhem, the Netherlands. His interest in military history dates back to the 1980s, when as a child he first visited the Airborne Museum at Oosterbeek. He went on to study political history at Radboud University in Nijmegen, while privately researching the exploits of American paratroopers. He's written a trilogy of books about the American 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment. And from the Netherlands, Frank Van Lunteren joins us now. Frank, welcome to the show. Yes, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much. We're honored as well. Your books are highly acclaimed. And I'm going to get to your books very soon because I wrote a screenplay on this exact regiment, but that that question wow. will come up. <laughs> that question yes. will come up later. I wanted to uh, know first why you picked this regiment. What was the catalyst to, uh, you know, dive into the five hundred fourth? Um, well, that's quite easy to explain. Um, I live in Arnhem, the Netherlands, and I was born there in nineteen eighty-two. Um, and I grew up as a child uh, listening to my grandfather's, um, my paternal grandfather's story about the Battle of Arnhem. My grandfather and his family, in fact, the entire city of Arnhem, uh, and we, we then speak in 1944 of 90,000 inhabitants, um, they all had to flee after the Battle of Arnhem. The Germans uh, evacuated the whole city. Mm. But he, he experienced from a, um, first from a distance, my grand, grandfather saw the, the British landings, uh, the airplanes coming over, the first airborne division landing there on 17 September 1944 as part of Operation Market Garden. Right. And on the 19th of September, my grandfather cycled um, to uh, a house of uh, a friend to collect some rabbits. Uh, they are, he had a large um, bicycle with a basket in the front. And he thought, well, you know, it's not so much fighting anymore. So he lived in the outskirts of Arnhem and he said, I'm just going to drive up there. And that's when he saw the result of the last British attempt of paratroopers to reach Arnhem Bridge to reinforce uh, a, a group of paratroopers that were already at the Rhine Bridge. Oh, yeah. And and that's he started to, to tell me. And then when I went to um, college in Nijmegen to be a history teacher and later I went to university, um, I would go five days a week across the Wild River and crossing the Wild River and having seen and read the book uh, A Bridge Too Far by Canadian Ryan at age 10, I was daily confronted with um, the, the Wild River and I could kind of imagine what it was like. But right. being a college student, I decided to um, dive more into it. And I was thinking, well, can I get in touch with a veteran? Um, and through the internet, uh, 82nd Airborne Division website, 
I got uh, in touch with Fred Baldino, mm -hmm. who was a, a World War II veteran of the 504. Uh, and that was in uh, May 2001 that I got in touch with him. So 20 years ago. And that led to other, speaking with other veterans from the unit? Um, yes, I, I was in touch with Fred Baldino uh, from 2001 um, until he, he passed away. Um, that was um, a couple of years ago, but he, um, uh, he, he, was, he invited me over to the United States. I came there in October 2003, and Fred, in his, uh, in his house, he had a large company photo of everyone in Company A, 504 First Infantry. And he had told me his story, and I listened to more stories as I was there. And he said, well, I have a couple of friends and uh, of my unit. We still keep in touch. And around that time, of course, Band of Brothers had come out. Right. And I had seen that series about Easy Company, 506, Perished Infantry. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, like, wow, but Fred's story is maybe just as unique or maybe even more because the 504 Regiment was earlier uh, activated in World War II. They were in the invasion of Sicily. They were fighting in Italy all before D-Day uh, at Anzio Beachhead. Um, Fred had made already uh, two uh, combat uh, jumps and one seaborne landing um, before D-Day started. And, and he was not involved in D-Day, but he, he jumped in, in Holland during Operation Market Garden. He rode on the Wall River Crossing and he was wounded on October 2nd. And that ended the war for Fred. But uh, he, his stories, I was like, wow, did someone has to do something with this, you know, with this group. And through Fred, I got the idea to um, interview everyone of Company A that I could find. So by 2006, we're speaking about three years later, I had written 300 pages book uh, only about Company A okay. uh, for the veterans. And I interviewed 45 members of A Company uh that were still alive i used rosters i just searched on the internet the telephone book uh on whitepages.com and i would if there's a unique combination i would just call and say hi my name is frank van lundrum i'm looking for um key johnson because one of them was named key johnson mm -hmm. and i called 18 people until i got the right one <laughs> and and it is, it's amazing because you know i would just say who i was and what i was trying to find and some people would say no it's not me click but yeah. some people would try to help me, and and when I found Key Johnson and I could put him in touch with one of his friends, Leonard Keck, also from A Company, they had not been in touch in sixty-two years. So oh, it, wow. it it was it was amazing also to connect um, those veterans uh, along sure. the way. Yeah, what an experience! Yeah, that was uh, one of my questions. If Stephen Ambrose's work had influenced your your starting it and your writing this series this trilogy yes i i really think so yes because um not only uh the series i was first um i first got to know stephen ambrose work maybe like many people through the series uh, band of brothers and then i started to read the book shortly after i also corresponded with um some of the easy company veterans like mm -hmm. carwood lipton shortly before he died richard winters um donald malarkey a lot of times and i met malarkey and garnier but of course, their story had already been recorded. And uh, what I found unique in the work of Ambrose is the way he, he sets up his book. It's all chronological. And what I like about the book of Ambrose, um, Band of Brothers, and later I also read others like Citizen Soldiers, is that he really quotes the soldiers long. And he also puts them in historic perspective that if you look at um, the titles of each chapter, uh, he also puts below there the place where they are, like, um, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, Elborn, England. And then he will put below there the time that they were there. So as a reader, with along with the maps, you can really follow them. And it's like you get to know them. Yes. And what I wanted to do um, after speaking to Fred Baldino and, and also to Albert Clark and other well, more and more veterans is I wanted to um, reconstruct as a tribute to those veterans, what they went through. And I wanted to tell it in their words. Yes. For instance, if I, if I summarize things in the third person narrative, it's not the same. And what I would like to do is by quoting letters, quoting diaries, um, by interviewing them, um, putting all those things together is that I try in my books to give the reader the feeling that he or she is 
with them and as it were walking behind them or slightly behind them through the battles and yeah. and uh, see it from their perspective so for italy the um, the book i wrote um, spearhead of the fifth army which covers the 504 in italy there had been a story of a lieutenant um who had shot down it was lieutenant stuart mccash and he had shot down an me 109 and um that was an amazing story but i was like i want an eye account and then after you get in touch with hundreds of people one day there was one uh, son of another lieutenant who said well my dad was there i wrote a letter about it oh. and so i got the the story of that lieutenant that was standing next to lieutenant mccash while he's raising up a browning automatic rifle and they were on a sudden strafing attack and he shot one down and that's that's the gold pieces that you try to find like you read about something and then sometimes two three four years five years later someone comes up and has the info and um for yeah. instance some of your readers might know ross carter's book those devils and baggy pants yes what i didn't use in um in that same book uh, spearhead of the fifth army uh because it's just too gruesome but Carter in his book describes one day that there's a group of replacements and they're in a shed and they're making a fire during the day. And Carter says, uh, don't do that. You know, you're drawing smoke. With smoke, you're drawing artillery fire. So um, he warns them and they were like, no, you know, we were OK. And so he walks on and Carter kind of describes, I think it was the same page or the next. And he says he walks by again the same place the next day and they're, they're hit. A shell came in and uh, the seven replacements, six are, are killed. Wow, and I got a picture from one of the veterans showing the remains that those those bodies in the cemetery uh, when they were not yet buried. I, oh. I, of course, obviously, I didn't use that picture, but um, once you find such items, um, it becomes more and more personal um, to yeah. me as a writer because you start to really see some of the things that they saw. Although it's of course a black and white picture, but it's it's them coming real close. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Coming up all next month, we're highlighting the seven black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. History will never be able to talk about Sergeant Carter unless they tell his story. They can't bury it anymore. His story will always be told. And that's why I appreciate so much what you're doing to keep this going. That's Aline Carter speaking on her father-in-law, Sergeant Edward Carter one of the recipients. We're celebrating the release of my book, Immortal Valor, on January 6th, with special contests and giveaways all month long. You won't want to miss them. That's all during January. The commander of the 504th, Reuben Henry Tucker, his nickname was Reuben Retreat Hell Tucker. How did he <laughs> earn that nickname? Um, well, that, that happened during the Battle of uh, Alta Villa. Alta Villa is, an, uh, is a small town um, which was on the American sector of the Salerno beachhead. In uh, September, early September 1943, after the uh, Allies had uh, successfully taken Sicily, um, the, uh, there was a change in the Italian situation. Mussolini was, um, was ousted by his own cabinet and, 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 and shortly a, a prisoner before he was saved by Hitler's commandos. And then um, the British army landed at Reggio, the southern tip of Italy, and the uh, American uh, US Fifth Army, which also included some uh, British uh, units, uh, they landed at Salerno. And um, it all went, first days went quite okay until the 36th Division was um, uh, fighting up at Altafil, a higher, a higher uh, town in the, in the mountains close to a very commanding hillside called Hill 424. And the German uh, uh, 16th um, um, Panzer Division, they, they, uh, they counterattacked there and they drove the uh, 36th Division back. And General Clark then re requested urgent reinforcements. So the 504 Regiment, um, only actually the 1st and 2nd Battalion and regimental uh, subunits, they were dropped uh, in to the beachhead at Paestum uh, close to the beach, and they were sent in to counterattack and take that hill. The first battalion got there to make a very long story short. It didn't happen all in one turn, but you know, bit by bit they came to that hill. They were surrounded. Uh, the second battalion nearby was also fighting on the other hilltops, 
um, the situation was getting uh, uh, more precarious. And then at a certain moment uh, on September 17, um, Colonel Tucker was ordered to withdraw his forces. And that, that order came from Sixth Corps. He was Sixth Corps commanded by General Ernest Dawley. Mm -hmm. And to the amazement, I think, of the Corps commanding staff, um, General Tucker answered, retreat, hell, send me my other battalion. Um, and that referred to his third battalion, which had been kept in, uh, in reserve. They had right. seaborne landed. And they did send up the third battalion. Uh, and indeed, they saved the beachhead which also earned the regiment um, the nickname Strike and Hold, uh, because they, uh, they, they, they went out and they took the objective, Alta Villa, and for Hill 424, and they held it. Uh, actually, first Hill 424, and then when the Germans were pushed back, also um, Alta Villa. Interesting fact with the battle is that um, Colonel Tucker was decorated with the Distinguished Service Cross, which he received uh, personally from President Franklin Roosevelt in December 1943 on Sicily. And he was standing next to um, General Mark Clark, who also received the Distinguished Service Cross. On the German side, um, the, the German battalion commander, I, I managed to find that uh, there was a battalion commander called Hauptmann Helmut uh, Meitzel. And Helmut Meitzel um, earned the uh, Knight's Cross, the German Knight's Cross, although he lost, but in the German records, um, they kind of presented it like a battalion of Panzer Grenadiers that were so tough and holding up a, a major group of American uh, paratroopers. In fact, that's completely true because, I mean, they, were, they had support yeah. from Sturm Geschütz, artillery, and, and whatever kind of heavy support. But Meitzel got a nice cross, but in fact, he failed because he didn't. Uh, he lost Hill 424, he lost all kinds of other hills, and he lost Alta Villa, and he had to get <laughs> get the heck out of there. Um, but they, he was still awarded the Knights Cross. And that's an that's funny when you're looking then into the German side. Um, yeah, how it's reported. And, uh, yep. Yeah, and, and I can read German, so that's why I, I also try to um, always, whenever possible, try to see the perspective from the enemy as yeah, well. I agree. Speaking of strike and hold and getting to my screenplay that I wrote about the Battle of Chinot, we've actually got an excerpt from a paratrooper, Staff Sergeant Curtis Adelot from Headquarters Company, 1st Battalion of the 504th, speaking to a reporter just two days after the battle. We left our Belvoir carry at approximately 8 o'clock. We were to jump off at 8 o'clock. We moved in and double filed one company on each side with our headquarters split up half on each side of the road. We moved up approximately 300 yards out from their main line of resistance. We got up there, they, they opened fire on us, and so we all had to split and just get in the best way we could. One officer out of our Baker company had two squads, and we went way to the right flank to outflank this uh, 20 millimeter flak wagon that was had the companies all pinned down in the open field. We got around and the officer was knocked out. So a bazooka man, he was not a bazooka man, but he grabbed a bazooka and myself led the 12 or 14 men on around. He knocked out two half tracks and got another one, got a hit on another one. I don't know whether it was knocked out or not. And at the same time, we hit approximately a platoon or maybe a company, you couldn't tell of Jerry's at this heavy strong point. There we lost quite a few men wounded, and we had to pull back and get some more men from the company, and they uh, bypassed the strong point and got men on in below it. How has that helped today's fighting? Well, if, it, if those 20 millimeters hadn't have got out of there, there wouldn't have been enough of us left, I don't expect by this time to do much fighting. Describe for our listeners that battle at Chino uh, during the Battle of the Bulge and why it was so pivotal? Well, the, the Battle of Chino was in fact, I think one of the major turning points uh, in the early stage of the Battle of the Bulge. Um, the um, very famous German SS um, uh, commander, uh, Jochen Piper, um, he, he led a Kampfgruppe or kind of like a battle group, but German they say uh, Kampfgruppe Piper. Um, and they were um, going ahead of the, the first SS Panzer Division. So he was kind of the, 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 fence, uh, the vanguard. 
And as a vanguard, he, um, he, he had orders to capture bridges across the Somme and the Amblev rivers. Now at Trappon, Trappon is in a Belgian town meaning three bridges. He was held up by the 505 uh, regiment and some engineers as well. First some engineers and then later some 505 paratrooper, uh, Persian infantry regiment. And so he tried to take, uh, to go to another place to cross those um, uh, rivers. And then he came to La Glace, where he ran into the 30th Infantry Division. And immediately south of La Glace is Cheneau. And when the 82nd Airborne Division uh, was sent up to the front lines, um, the 504 Regiment received orders to, uh, to attack Cheneau. It had been uh, already established that um, Piper had must uh, must have had troops uh, occupying that area but colonel tucker didn't know the extent of the german forces he could um faith them that, that there were of course uh, panzer grenadiers that there were tanks but he had no um clear idea of the real strength so when they attacked on the um and they they, they, they moved into the battle on the 20th of december so we're speaking then of the fourth day of the battle of the bulge um the first battalion was sent in with two rifle companies, B and C company leading, um, and they were up against uh, barbed wire fences. They were up against uh, two companies of Panzer Grenadiers, machine guns. Uh, the Germans had mobile flak wagons with 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter cannons. Um, so it was kind of like lightly armed two paratroop infantry companies against Panzer Grenadiers that were at the same strength almost, but also a lot more artillery and, and tank support even. Uh, was, uh, so that battle um, became more or more bigger. Um, Colonel uh, Tucker decided to uh, employ G Company from the 3rd Battalion to reinforce uh, the 1st Battalion. Um, at a certain moment, Colonel Harrison, the battalion commander of the 1st Battalion, radioed to Colonel Tucker like, um, I need more uh, reinforcements because I have only in one company, uh, 35 men left. The other company, I don't know, maybe 50. Um, I am B company, all the officers are, are wounded or, or killed. So um, Tucker sent in G company. Now the G company captain, uh, Captain uh, uh, Gauthier, uh, he was very, uh, he was told that if when he went into the town, it would be like, a, you know, like just reinforcing or relieving uh, company B. Mm -hmm. um, and as his men made their way through the woods, they ran into um, flak wagon fire, they ran into machine gun fire. And uh, so the battle um, was was really on a larger, larger scale. Eventually, it was won also because of two tank destroyers that were sent in, some uh, airborne engineer uh, platoon was sent in. And there was a flanking attack the next morning on the 21st by the remainder of the 3rd Battalion. So in fact, it's an assault. And um, it, it lasted nearly two days. And, and if you compare that to Bastogne, the Battle of Bastogne is a defensive operation of the 101st Airborne Division, right. which was um, beautifully executed in, in many ways because they had support for the, I believe there was a 10th Armored there. There were some independent artillery units. Um, they, they held up and, 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 and defended that place uh, magnificently. Um, but, but with the 82nd, we're looking at an attack. I mean, you know, was in German hands, and they are taking it. Whereas, if you look at the Hunter First Airborne, they uh, they have Bastogne and they keep Bastogne. Um, I'm not saying that Hunter First did a not not as great job as the 82nd. The only big difference is the offensive part in the 82nd and the defensive part operation in Hunter First. Right, and it's considered Chino is considered uh, the first. Um, American victory in the Battle of the Bulge. Is that correct? Yes, it, it was certainly the first um, the first town actually that was retaken from uh, from the Germans, and the Battle of Chenot also forced when the twenty on the twenty first when uh, December twenty one when the American paratroopers uh, finally took uh, Chenot. Uh, then um, Jochen Piper uh, had to decide to call off all his uh, actions and redraw. Um, because at La Glace, he, he was still kind of fighting and holding up, but um, Cheneau was just very close by on the other side of the river, and because the bridge had been taken there by the Americans, he, he had to pull out, and he did during the night. Now, this is a trilogy of books on the 504th, but you have a fourth coming this spring. Could you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yes, the fourth book coming up is called Bird of a Regiment, and it will cover the 504 Pierce Infantry uh, in the uh, activation of the regiment in May 42, all the way up going to North Africa in the Battle of Sicily, uh, Sicily and uh, ending in uh, Salerno Beachhead. So, so you, you, you with, with Bird of a Regiment, you follow them from May 1942 all the way to September 1943. It's one and a half years of combat. And I called it Bird of a Regiment because uh, next year, 2022, they exist for 80 years oh. and, uh, continuously, which is, I think, very unique. If you compare it to, for instance, the 506 Regiment that also exists today, but they have had a period where they were deactivated. And the 504 Pierce Infantry is, uh, uh, was, was founded May 1, 1942, and it still um, exists. And now uh, next year will be 80 years uh, of uh, existence. That's great. His books are all about the 504th Parachute Infantry Regiment, and hopefully you can check them all out. Frank, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much, and um, it was a pleasure to be there, yes. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Coming up all next month, we're highlighting the seven Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. History will never be able to talk about Sergeant Carter unless they tell his story. They can't bury it anymore. His story will always be told. And that's why I appreciate so much what you're doing to keep this going. That's Aline Carter speaking on her father-in-law, Sergeant Edward Carter, one of the recipients. We're celebrating the release of my book, Immortal Valor, on January 6th, with special contests and giveaways all month long. You won't want to miss them. That's all during January. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter, at Rob Child, where you can share your comments about the show. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.